Hi, everybody. This is our first Tuesday community chat in quite a while now. So uh, glad to have the folks with us that, that managed to tune in. I'm Eli Beckman. I'm the mayor. We've also got town clerk and assistant town manager, Rebecca Vaughn. We've got our fire chief, Ruben Martin. We've got our code enforcement and communications director, Mike Moriarty. And we've got our parks and rec director, Ashley Howe, back from uh, maternity leave. We're very glad to have her back with us. Ashley, you haven't, you this is your first uh, like Zoom meeting with us back uh, with the with the public at least since you got back, right? Yes. Excellent. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, I have, I guess, a few brief updates, and we'll see if staff have any other updates before we just open it up for our normal um, anything questions, whatever members of the public want to talk about. A few things I wanted to mention: a lot of public works projects going on uh, that people, especially on the east side, have probably started seeing already. So we've got. Uh, the 2021 road rehabilitation project that's our big kind of annual road work uh, is happening i think one of the big pieces of that is paradise drive that is fantastic i think paradise is you know the last major thoroughfare in town besides casa buena that hasn't gotten uh you know some love shown to it we did the the complete streets project on tamil pies and tamil vista and i know a lot of east side residents who rely on paradise drive every day to get to and from home work wherever uh, it's a it's been a bumpy ride for years, so we're we're very appreciative to Public Works for for making that happen. Um, that's going to be coming along with a number of other streets on the east side, and then kind of uh, in in uh, in kind of uh, partnership with that is going to be the the sewage rehabilitation project. So there's going to be a lot of underground uh, sewage work happening. Um, I believe that where those happen on the same streets, they're going to be timed so that any sewer or underground work happens before we have to do any repaving. Um, RJ has just joined us, so I will let him uh, speak uh, to uh, give any details on, on those projects, but those are things I'm excited about. Other than that, on the operations front, um, as folks know, the, the town council has given its approval to rebuild town hall, and so we've just started looking at, uh, you know, operationally, we're going to probably be renting some temporary office space at Hunt Plaza on Tamil Vista and move operations there temporarily uh, while that construction work happens, but what's really exciting is that it's going to give us the opportunity in this new temporary space to open up a public council chamber and a publicly accessible, um, you know, kind of public works and planning counter, which are services that we've not really been able to offer at the current town hall since COVID. Uh, so it's going to be really good to be able to be offering those opportunities for the members of the public to come in and interface with us in person again. Um, it's been a long time. So, so we're going to be glad to, to go back to that. Um, I think that's all I've got. So I'm going to turn it over to staff now to give any updates. Uh, who would like to start us off? All right, RJ. Um, so I did hear you. I, I accidentally clicked on the attendee list. So I did hear the, the intro and, and yes, thank you. Um, there is a lot going on and we're, we're doing our best. It's, um, it's a lot of work to kind of cram into a short window. Um, this is really the critical week on Paradise Drive. Um, so the good news is that um, we're really hoping to have everything completed by end of day Friday and have the, the road paved and, and have it you know, match up nicely with the sidewalk that's been going on for um, the last several months. Um, so that's the, the positive look forward. Um, the other pieces, you know, it's, it's been a tough couple of days and, and even some um, delays last week and, and before. Um, but I think you're going to see, um, probably saw some adjustments today. We've got some um, flaggers at intersections trying to expedite people through. Um, I did actually notice a lot of vehicle drivers were kind of tentative at times and, and sometimes slowing down unnecessarily. And so we're trying to get people to just kind of move at the, the standard pace. And then also um, the work won't start tomorrow until about 830. And then we'll actually have two um, vehicle lanes in the eastbound direction in the morning as well up until at least 830. So um, that should drastically improve the, the morning commute. And then um, I think a lot of the, the evening stuff at least is spread out because I know a lot of the schools get out closer to 2.33 and then you've got the folks commuting that come home later. So at least it's not all at the same time. It's at least spread out amongst those two events. So, um, but again, the, the real good news is that um, we're hoping that it's open and we're planning on to be open by the end of the week, so. That's awesome, RJ, thank you. And I really appreciate that you- the, the other projects as well, so. I appreciate that you guys are going out of your way to, to mitigate any traffic impacts on that because that is a, a, an important artery there. So thanks a lot for doing that. And I know residents appreciate it too. Great, any other updates from staff before we turn this over to the public? Let's go to Ruben. 
All right. Uh, thank you, Mayor Beckman. Um, I want to welcome back uh, members of the public. It's definitely been a while, so it's good to see everybody's names up there. Just kind of want to give you guys an update. Um, and everyone's probably concerned about all the fires that have been going on throughout the state. Um, your Central Morin firefighters have been involved in supporting other communities during these fires. We've been up at the Dixie Fire, up at the Calder Fire, and all these major complexes that are going up north. Um, the Dixie Fire, primarily, we've been at that one since the onset with crews rotating in and out. And with these fires burning up north, I just want to reassure everyone that um, your stations here locally are always fully staffed and able to respond to any incident within the county and more importantly, within our own jurisdiction. Um, another thing that's pretty exciting, as many of you may have seen, is the amount of work that uh, we've been doing along the roadways, uh, removing a lot of hazardous vegetation across the town. Um, and all this is um, primarily funded through Measure C, which is your Wildfire Prevention Authority tax and your Measure F funding. So we're fortunate here in Corte Madera that we've got two um, fuels reduction funding sources that allow us to do more than what our neighboring agencies are doing. So one of the things that we like is that with this initiative and these tax measures, it's work that we can actually physically see happening right in front of us. Um, there's a lot of work going on right now along Corte Madera Avenue um, just to reduce a lot of the uh, hazardous vegetation on both sides of the road. We've done a lot along Meadow Suite, Meadow Valley, um, the Casa Buena area, and then also along east side of Corte Madera. Um, so if um, you see any of the crews out there, just thank them. Um, Todd Lando has been running around with his head cut off for the last uh, year and a half or so, and we're very grateful to have him and uh, look forward to uh, seeing new projects coming down the road. That's all I have for you. Great. Thank you, Chief. And thanks for the great work. Hey, one question I did have for you, actually. I think it was last week, if I recall, that we had one of those weird kind of thunderstorms roll through uh, overnight. And it just reminded me how I think it was, was it last year or two years ago when we had that crazy lightning storm that started, you know, like the lightning complex fire, fire and all that. Um, and I was just curious, do you guys see these, uh, I, I feel like we never used to have these. Do you see these kind of dry summer thunderstorms as, as a more, uh, more frequent, more recent kind of advent? Um, yeah, at least my 20 years here in the county. Um, I had one maybe about 14 years ago that came through that was a red flag event. And then last year was, and the year before that is when we started seeing a lot of these monsoonal moistures push up from the south, which is very rare for us. Um, typically, however, I think it's starting to become the new normal. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. That's uh... Another thing for us to be on the lookout for. Uh, thanks. Yeah, and, and, and our biggest concern is that these monsoonal moistures, usually when they come through the summertime, especially for us, they don't carry a lot of rain with it. And so that's where we, especially last year, there was very little rain with the right. thunderstorm that came through. So it actually caused a lot more fires. This time, I think we had a little more moisture with it that was able to at least dampen the ground where these strikes were happening. Got it. Thank you. Any other updates from staff? Yeah, Ashley. I just wanted to, um, to draw everybody's attention. We're trying to mobilize to reopen. So I know there's a lot of questions out there in the community and it's something that, that uh, they've been hearing that we're waiting for a little bit more information from where we are with the Delta variant. And I know we're almost reaching that two week period after Labor Day. So we're just being really careful and cautious to make sure that we're all being safe. Um, we're gonna begin with um, front desk hours, Monday through Friday from nine to four. And that's our function is going to be to assist with questions, tennis keys, Thursday book and puzzle exchange that we're concurrently doing, restroom access, and then class and program registrations. And then beginning to welcome back our community groups for use of the facility for our meetings and small events. So we appreciate everybody's patience as we're doing the most responsible and safest way to roll out these, these reopenings. Um, just to recognize that some of the barriers that we have to reopening immediately is um, making sure that we've uh, increase the, the contract with our cleaning company because that's the step one in making sure that we can keep our building sanitized and safe for not only our employees, but for anybody that's utilizing it. Um, and then hiring staff and classifications to support um, any use. So that's facility tenants that would be doing all the setup and, and takedown of equipment so that our staff doesn't get hurt and our, client, and our clients don't get hurt doing so. And then custodial service, um, making sure we have policies and procedures in place related to COVID. So whether we're able to 
whether we are able to and should be asking for vaccinations, require vaccinations. There's a lot of different litigious stuff that we need to make sure are ironed out so that we can um, protect not only our employees, our town and our community. We want to see you. <laughs> we're starting with congregate meals uh, next Thursday. So we're reaching out to some of our seniors beginning with um, the first 30 that can RSVP that's uh, through the county. So we're excited to be able to do that service again. Amazing. So glad to hear that that stuff is finally starting to, to ramp back up. I know it's been really tough because I feel like for the first year of COVID, we all felt like we just had to make it, you know, make it to vaccination time and then we would be good to go. And, and with Delta coming around, I think it's really kind of uh, shown us all a much more complex and kind of disappointing, frankly, reality. So appreciate all the hard work there, both from you and, and all the other departments uh, in really kind of trying to keep things rolling and, and not let Delta um, stop us from, you know, reintroducing services that we had been offering before. So thank you. Any other updates from staff here before we turn this over? Let's go to Mike. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, just wanted to announce that uh, earlier in this month, we um, we engaged uh, our current code enforcement officer and elevated him to a full-time status, Adam Wiley. He's actually a resident of Puerto Madera, and uh, he's really done a fantastic job for us and is really finding the balance between uh, letter of the law, spirit of the law, and just really um, trying to problem solve uh, situations within the community. Um, I also want to add that, uh, you know, over the last couple of months, we had a lot of incidents occur at Town Park involving vandalism and dogs off the leash. We, we had a lot of issues at Town Park. And so we allocated more resources to the park. We have another uh, part-time uh, code enforcement officer who's been working in the evenings and on weekends. So you'll, you, if you're around on the weekends and you see the white car with the town logo on it, that's, that's uh, my team. They're out there and about and they're, they're dealing with uh, parking issues. They're dealing with dogs off the leash. A variety of all of our quality of life issues. Uh, we're working on um, uh, establishing a, a parking enforcement and and really a, trying to uh, assist CMPA with some of the parking concerns that they don't have the time or resources to get to. So starting next month or in the next couple of weeks. Um, the two code enforcement officers are going to be keeping an eye on handicapped uh, zones and fire zones and and the and the um, the designated parking spaces on Christmas Tree Hill to ensure that our community is safe at all times. And so, um, and with that, one of the last things that we're about to roll out is, is, as you know, we approved the administrative citation ordinance several months ago. Well, we've put a lot of time and energy and, and the resources behind that to develop the actual citation and develop policy about issuance and the appeals board, et cetera. So all that is coming to a head. We have uh, ordered those citations. They should be in any minute. Uh, any day, and um, we're going to slowly roll out that enforcement. Um, uh, and as it's it's an administrative an administrative enforcement, and uh, we're hoping to reduce the impact to CMPA on calls for service. And so, uh, with that, I leave it uh, to the community for any other questions that they may have for code enforcement or communications during this chat. Thank you. Great, Mike. Thank you so much. And you have done a fantastic job building up that that capacity for us to be able to really meet and exceed residents, uh, you know, demands of us for for what they want to see enforcement on. So thank you so much. I know uh, you kind of built that that wing of the department from scratch. So fantastic work there. Yeah, thank uh, you. My pleasure. Yeah. Any other updates from staff before we open this up to public? We'll go to Adam. Yeah, just real quick. Um, just wanted to we're going to be making a big push for getting people involved in a community conversation about housing in the, um, over the, well, the conversation is gonna last for, for many months, if not years, like the next couple of years, but really we'll be making a, a push to sort of sign up for um, notices on the housing element um, uh, workshop series that we're gonna start on October 13th. Um, for those who are interested, really, uh, the next council meeting will be talking about the work plan, which I think will provide a good overview of, of sort of the housing element itself and what we need to do to uh, um, get a compliant housing element by January of 2023, which seems kind of far away, but is right around the corner, really. So um, just be on the lookout for that. Um, please reach out if you have any questions, um, but you'll be seeing a, you'll be hopefully uh, flooded with, uh, not literally, but flooded with information on housing um, policy discussions and conversations and, and really our need to 
plan for a significant number of housing units um, over the next decade. So. Thanks. And Adam, would you mind just for folks who might not be familiar, just super high level, what is the housing element? Yes, yeah, so the housing element is a uh, one chapter of the town's general plan when the general plan is really the so the overarching policy document of the town. Uh, and so housing is housing focused and the centerpiece that most people focus on and that most of us it's really what most well known for is the state provides us sort of a certain number of housing units, um, certain number of affordable housing units at different income levels. We need to plan for that, meaning we need to identify the uh, adequate number of housing sites or locations where this amount of housing could go in our community. Um, and this time it happens every eight years. Um, so what we're gonna be talking about this time around is from the 2023 to 2031, time period. And so that's that's actually the, the core of what we're talking about. But frankly, it's a broader conversation as well about all sorts of housing programs and policies that a lot of which we've already been doing, um, you know, and, and do on a yearly basis and things we've been doing. But nonetheless, um, I think most of the attention um, is going to be focused around this. Where is this new housing going to be plan for and just to be clarified we're not building it we're just sort of creating the regular regulations that allow for that housing to be constructed great thank you so much adam um awesome any other uh, last updates from staff before we go to the public here rebecca oh, thank you very but i just wanted to uh draw everyone's attention to the recording of the september 7th town council meeting i know there's a lot of questions and concerns in the community about the ongoing drought situation and um I just noticed online that uh, that meeting only has 10 views so far. And I wanted to make sure everyone was aware that we had a presentation given to council from Lucy Croy, the water quality manager for MMWD, who just provided an update on the uh, current capacity levels, current uh, drought situation and uh, conservation recommendations and um, ideas for the community to help reduce the water usage. So. It's, it's probably just a few minutes into that meeting and it's easy to watch and maybe 10 to 15 minutes of your time and hopefully it will provide you all with some good information. Great, thank you, Rebecca. And now without further ado, we're gonna turn it over to the members of the public on the line here. Thank you guys for your uh, patience. So go ahead and raise your hand here on Zoom if there's anything you'd like to talk about or ask us and we'll bring you right on and we're gonna start with Heinz and then go to Lucinda next. Um, I'm driving on Paradise Drive, coming from Golden Hind, going to um, Prince Royal. There are those blinking lights for the crosswalk, and they are completely hidden. You can't see it because the oleanders stick out so far that anybody stepping off the sidewalk won't see the car, and the car can't see the, even the light and the yield sign. So you might want to have somebody either the town or the owner of the only end who's trimming back a little bit. Yeah, we'll jump on that. Thanks. Okay. It's a deal. I'll Great. lower you, my man. hand. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Appreciate it. All right. We're going to go to Lucinda next, followed by Susie. Welcome back. It's nice to have the town chat back in operation. Um, hey. I did have several things. Uh, Ruben, I wanted to commend you and all of your staff, Tat, Todd and all for the clearing that they've done up here on the hill um, and along Corte Madera Avenue. It is outstanding and I'm glad to see that it's still ongoing. It is a huge job. What's going to be the situation going forward? Will this be an annual um, event so that the growth that comes back doesn't repeat what we had to so diligently deal with this year? Uh, Lucinda, so the goal is to come back, if not every year, every couple of years to take a look at it. So we'll monitor it. It's uh, We equate vegetation management to kind of like maintaining the Golden Gate Bridge. Once you're done with it, you got to come back right to the beginning and keep doing it. So it'll end up being a continual process. So that way we maintain it clear. Thank you. 
Um, do you have, again, Ruben, do you have any um, update on that fire that was in the uh, Golden Gate National Reserve uh, above Sausalito that happened, I believe, last Saturday? Do you have any update on what caused that fire and a little information about it? No, I do not. Um, unfortunately, uh, I don't have access to their fire reports. Um, but I'll see what I can find out by speaking to my colleagues on the fire chief side. Thank you. That was really scary. Um, and then um, I know that the topic of vaccines came up with, with somebody's report. Uh, I think it was Ashley's. Um, what is the town doing with regard to requiring it um, or having the requirement of weekly tests? I, I just don't know the status of where we are as a town, um, but I highly support getting that in place if it's not already. Actually, is that something you're able to speak to at all? I feel like that may be, I, I feel like greater vaccine policy is probably a Todd question who couldn't be with us today. Um, do you do you have anything, Ashley? That's an administrative, and I think that that's probably related to what tomorrow's uh, mandate of having that going out for our municipal employees. But I don't have an answer to that. Having just gotten back, I'm not sure what the direction of administration is. Um, Mayor Beck, then I can speak. Well, I know um, I believe on August 20th, uh, Dr. Willis put out a new health order requiring first responders. So it's your law enforcement and your fire department to be, have to attest to being either fully vaccinated or have to do weekly testing. Um, right now, I can tell you that we've already attested to the status of all of our employees and those that are not or have chosen not to be vaccinated will then require weekly testing. Thank you. Uh, and what will they do about the opening of the center, the community center with regard to requirements for folks coming in to um, utilize our, our uh, facilities? I guess, Ashley, that goes to you. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part of my hesitation on reopening right now is finding what our legal direction is right now. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I'll sorry, I don't have a clear answer for you on that one. I'll ask it again in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Lucinda, and, and we'll we'll be happy to follow up with you on this because I think this we're all eager to figure the, out the answer to this stuff just as much as you're eager to hear it. So, um, okay. a, a, a very important and timely question, though. So, thank you. Okay, um, and I wondered if there was a kind of an update. We haven't heard one recently of um, vandalism. I heard uh, some mention of vandalism in the town park. Um, kind of what's been the history most recently of problems with law enforcement and vandalism within the town? Is it increasing, decreasing, it's staying the same? What kind of where is that been? I could try to answer that. I think it's really hit or miss and it really depends on the amount of people in the park and who's visiting. We don't, we can't, I can't tell you whether they're locals or if they're visitors. Um, I will tell you that for several um, weekends in a row and that was back in, July and August, um, we would have vandalism graffiti in the skate park, uh, as well as the adjacent bathrooms. And so that was predominantly in the men's bathroom. And that would be a burden to public works maintenance crew to have to reprime, repaint, etc. cetera. Um, I'm working right now with Central Rim Police Authority. They have a uh, an officer assigned to the park as a community oriented policing project. And so we're sharing information. Um, and I'm sharing those tags that we've collected over the time, the different um, mnemonics, that, that monikers, so to speak, that uh, these individuals are using. And they're, and they're popping up sporadically around town on signs and dumpsters. And, um, but I will tell you that the resources, we had Cody at the park uh, pretty much, uh, let's see, two, three evenings a week and on rotating both days on the weekend. So we've had almost seven days a week coverage at the park with the code enforcement officer between Adam and Cody. And so for six weeks, we had no vandalism. And so two weeks ago, we did have some uh, vandalism to the inside of the bathrooms. It was totally different than what we've seen before. These were like more of like an artwork. Um, I would say that it's not the same individuals that were doing these tags at the skate park. Um, you know, vandalism and graffiti is, is, is something that's been around for years. I don't think it's ever going to change, but uh, RJ and I met with um, DC Electric uh, a couple weeks ago, and we're, we're, we're talking, we're actively discussing 
potential cameras around the areas that are most uh, impacted. Uh, so that would be the areas near the near the tennis courts and in uh, and uh, close to the the skate park that will um, record uh, what's what's transpiring in those areas. Not in the bathroom, but the, the alleyway that walks to the bathroom. So we're just trying to get a handle on who's you know who's frequently in the area and potentially limit uh, who. who or, try to determine who's involved in some of the vandalism, but just allocating the resources to the problem has um, definitely subsided the issue. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, well, I think when you put up the cameras and then put up more signs than you have cameras, that'll be a big deterrent. Yeah, and I I, um, I walked over there a few weeks ago and I was with Aaron with, um, with the rec department and I spoke with the kids there and I, and I basically made it real, real clear to them that, you know, the actions of one are really going to have a negative impact on those, uh, those who really are enjoy the, the skate park and basically told them, I said, Hey, the skate park is a privilege and uh, the actions of one are could potentially um, cause for us to temporarily close the skate park. And that really made a difference. That was right before the six week uh, delay. So there was some, level of ownership to that park and, and some integrity. And so there's some internal policing with some of the older kids and the younger kids. So we just need to keep, you know, keep on it. And, uh, you know, we're never going to be able to prevent it from occurring because um, it, it's just, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a problem and it's not just court of Madera. I mean, other communities have it way worse. So, yeah. Thanks. I think that's great. Um, also, uh, Mike, what, what's the situation with barking dogs? I know I, I finally had to complain because it was just unbelievable that somebody would leave their dog outside and then go away for a Saturday or a Friday night un, until after midnight and the dog would just bark incessantly. And, and I, what, what's the situation with uh, citing people for that? Because by the time the officer can get up there, the dog might not be barking. Right. So um, I will tell you that in my couple of years here, I've only dealt with one or two barking dog complaints that originated, that, you know, somebody posted an incident um, on the website. I got it on Monday morning. Um, typically, these barking dogs, they happen, you know, in the evening hours when staff's not here. And so um, it, it, the only real resource is calling CMPA and they will respond. But I know that they're busy right now dealing with a variety of calls for service. And even when we've called them for assistance, I mean, there's been times that they're unable to respond. They're dealing with some kind of a, a felony or, or something more yeah. serious. And so um, I will tell you that about two weeks ago, I received a, a complaint from a neighbor and somewhere up here on the hill in Chapman Park. And they were very frustrated. It was late. And uh, they left a message in uh, my voicemail late at night. And they essentially, you know, they identified the house. And so I, as much I wasn't able to resolve it that evening, but I followed up the next day with a phone call and then a thoughtful email to the owner. And he, he, you know, fell on the sword, was very apologetic, had left town, left the dog, you know. So anyway, we, we, we try to resolve these community problems and follow up with the property owner and try to um, prevent these from reoccurring. But, you know, to answer your question, uh, CMPA is really your, your um, enforcement um, hand on barking dogs and and even when i was a policeman here 20 years ago we were we were getting calls to barking dogs but what happens is you get the barking dog call the officer goes to the neighborhood they sit in the neighborhood they park you turn the car off they sit and they listen they don't hear the dog bark because um, you park down the street because you don't want to create more of an issue with the dog barking it, it, it's somewhat tricky to enforce but um, it's similar to the gas leak blowers, where if I get a complaint and we're not able to respond, I follow up the property owner, let them know this is a problem. Typically, when the town calls you and says, "Hey, we have a, a you know community concern about your your pets or the dog leak blower, or whatever," I mean, people are very receptive to trying to change the and correct the behavior and conditions. So, uh, happy to engage any you know resident or neighbor that you have to prevent this from occurring uh, in the future. It's just uh, share, share the information and I'll, I'll do my best as usual. Thank you very much. My last thing, and I'm sorry to have so many things, but we haven't had a meeting for a while. <laughs> um, uh, what is the status of the lawsuit with regard to uh, Corte Madera joining it and uh, on the RENA allocation of the number of houses that have to be included in our building plans 
um, I guess that goes to Ad Adam, but um, it, it just seemed like we had an, an inordinate number of, of required buildings or new yeah. homes. So the, the draft arena that we received was for about 725 units. Uh, we did file, file an appeal, uh, the town did, um, and that was in, I think, uh, by the deadline, I think the first week in July. A hearing date has been set for September 29th. Um, but there are, th this isn't, there's no, this isn't a legal process or lawsuit, um, just to be clear about that, uh, unless you're speaking to uh, something else that's broader and I'm uh, unaware of, um, maybe regionally or something like that, but. No, you're right on, you're right okay. on. Okay, yeah, so there was an appeal filed and, and that will be heard uh, again September 29th, I think. Um, we have a time slot between 9, 9 and 1 p.m. or something like that. It's heard by a uh, board, certain board members of the Association of Bay Area Governments, ABAG. Uh, and so um, uh, that's, that's the next step in the process. And Lucinda, we, we can make sure that we get a public report at a council meeting uh, when there's an, an outcome from that. And, you know, if, if there are potential next steps to take, we can make sure that, that staff brief us on that and, and let the public know at the time. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you for allowing me so much time. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. As you said, it's, it's been a while. So I understand if folks have some, some questions built up. Uh, we're going to go to Susie next, followed by Karen. Hi, I also missed you guys. <laughs> I guess I almost see Eli in the neighborhood, but not often enough. And <laughs> Ruben at the, at the fire department, but it's, I'm afraid you're stuck with this Zoom for a while because I've, so we've sort of become addicted to it a little bit. Ashley, welcome back. It's so exciting. I'm happy to see you. And I'm really glad that there is the opportunity for you to have the time off that parents deserve when, so I think that's a great thing. I think I have things for all of you. I want to say, RJ, that I love the wide sidewalk. Um, I walk down to the marsh all the time from my house and I was getting, so I really hated walking along that narrow street and just the width of it, just, it, you feel so much safer. It's just more comfortable and it's really great. And the guys that have been working there have been really nice. They know that it's an inconvenience and, you know, there are some sour faces on some of these moms that are in a hurry in the morning. And I understand, but, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's coming along fine. Um, we are anxious to have our sidewalks in Mariner Cove's uh, getting worked on. That's a, another thing. And, but we did our homework over here, as you know, and I think that that's in process. So thanks for all that. Um, I did, I have two, uh, two main things. And I guess one of them, I was hoping Todd was going to be here because uh, both of these I've discussed with him before. And one has to do, uh, oh, a little bit with Adam, but, but it's lowering the fees, the, the permit fees on some of the safety features. It has to do with Ruben and Adam more because the safety features like a gas shutoff valve, uh, our permit fees in Corte Madera for gas shutoff valve were like twice what Larkspur's was. And uh, I checked others. I've talked to you about this before, but anyway, Todd said that he was going to take a look at all those things that were safety features that were related to safety. And he said that he was gonna take it to council and make sure that things were in line or that they could maybe make them less money or whatever. So um, I would appreciate some follow through with that. Uh, I'm sure there are other things besides the gas shutoff valve maybe that people pay high fees for that there are safety issues that keep our town safer. So I think that's really important. And I'd like to you know, have you look at that and make sure that it does go to council if it needs to, uh, Eli. So that'd be good. Susie, I'll follow up with Todd on that, but I think his intention was to take it as part of the full fee schedule evaluation that we haven't done since 2015, and we are due to be doing that. Uh -huh. uh, and I, I don't think he would want to do a one-off amendment to the existing fee schedule, knowing that that fee schedule is already out of date. But let me just check in with him and see sure. where we're at with that. Yeah, um, that's that's what he told me as well, Rebecca. And I, okay. I think Susie, I, I think the I think everybody agrees with you. I think that's a common sense thing to do is to lower those barriers to making safety improvements to your house. Um, so I think we're all with you there. I think it's just a question of of getting it through the process. Sure, great. Well, 
we'll we'll I'll keep mentioning it until the process shows up. <laughs> I appreciate your advocacy because that is an important one. Thank you. And then this is another thing that I've talked about before, and it has to do with vegetation, but and and the job that Ruben and team and all those guys are doing everywhere is out of this world. The one area that they don't necessarily have control of is the overpass area. The uh, we're you know we go from across Tamalpais over Highway 101. We've got clover leaves on you know there are four separate sections over there, and I I'll tell you this was kind of interesting. Um, so I I understand from Todd, and I had a communication with him about this, and I think it was at the end of August maybe. Um, I think he said that uh, there is a. Uh, there are companies that Corte Madera contracts with that are Caltrans approved, I believe that's right, and that he was going to look into those companies and see there's a certain amount of money that Corte Madera can spend on those areas. It's not just Caltrans, but it is awful again out there. And we had the same conversation last year. So I just want to tell you briefly about my personal experience. I had an opportunity to, uh, I needed to walk up to the middle of the overpass uh, about a week and a half ago, um, walking from the east side of Corte Madera to the top of the overpass. So I parked at the village shopping center at the way at the Macy's end and walked across the crosswalk that crosses the highway there. Well, I'm telling you, I shouldn't have been walking there. It's not safe. It is, um, I mean, this is besides the fire issues and the dry issues. There were spots where there were obviously homeless people had been there or someone who had spent a lot of time there. It looked to me like there was a dark spot on the ground that could have been a small fire. I won't say it was for sure, but it's sort of off to the right. A lot of broken bottles down there. There's trash and it does just, it's dark and scary and awful. And I drove past Novato the other day and they have mowed down their sections that are in of all those quarters, parts of the overpass. It's mowed down, it's low. There are a few plants inside, none of them are dead. You can see visually through the area. I really think that we have to do that. It's just, it's not safe fire-wise. It's not good homeless wise, and it's not safe for people to walk across. And I think, you know, it's really sad, and this is a bit of another topic, but that East Corte Madera people cannot walk nicely over to the other side. I think if we could, it would increase business. I mean, there are times I go for two, three mile walks, but I don't wanna walk all the way down to Cospless through the Warnham Tunnel, all the way through that neighborhood to get into the town area. It would behoove our town to really, really look again at better crossing. But that's those are like three topics all in one. So um, I won't go any further, but I think you all understand. I'd love you to walk with me someday. One of you come with me and walk up there and see how I, you like it. I volunteer as tribute. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's awful. So from the fire perspective, it needs to be looked at. For safety, it needs to be looked at. And for the element of just being nice to have a decent place to, to get to the other side by foot or bicycle, because we're supposed to be doing that nowadays. Yeah, so. I, I totally know what you mean, Susie. And for what it's worth, I've been biking to a lot more local meetings lately. So I'm biking over that overpass like multiple times a day. And so I know exactly what you mean. Um, yeah. RJ, can you jump in here and speak? I, I know um, that Caltrans, I think, has something in the hopper for this area. Yeah, so kind of on the project side, um, last I heard they were going to have some sort of outreach event this fall to start talking about some overcrossing improvements that could occur as early as 2025. Um, this is mul multiple years worth of work. And so I, I wasn't here for the original kind of product development, but there's five to seven alternatives that are kind of being looked at, you know, some with higher price tags in the, you know, $25 million range that aren't funded and others that actually do have funding programmed with Caltrans that are probably half that. Um, but they are going to be looking to the community to hopefully build a consensus and 
um, if that consensus is built at the lower cost project, it could get implemented in the 2025 range. Um, it'll address um, ADA and seismic retrofits to the structure, but also um, we'll look at overall multimodal improvements for bike pads and vehicles. So uh, that, that'll be great. I mean, we do have two shopping centers here that have a vested interest in also making that better. And then maybe they could, you know, work with the community as well, get them involved also because it just behooves everybody. But in the meantime, let's clean it up. It's our entrance to our sweet town. Yeah. RJ, are you able to speak to, that was the long-term option, are you able to speak to kind of any potential ways we could make some progress in the short sure. term? I know yeah. everything's incredibly I, difficult with Caltrans. I, I know um, Todd what? has been leading the effort and, and he has um, obtained or at least tentatively obtained an encroachment permit for Caltrans to proceed and, and do some of that vegetation management work. Um, there are, with all Caltrans things, additional hurdles and I think there's a training element where before, you know, if our team gets involved, they have to go to a series of trainings before they can get out in that area. So that was kind of the last I heard. It, it definitely has not been dropped. Um, it's just, you know, trust me, even um, something as simple as restriping a road in Caltrans is a, is a long process. So um, we have to just kind of go step by step and work through it, but it is being pursued and hopefully that'll, uh, you know, have some fruition here shortly. I want to see if Novato can do it. We can do it for heaven's sake. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks. I know everybody's worked really hard. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Susie, and really good points that you brought up there. And thank you, RJ. We're going to go to Karen next, followed by Patty. Hello. Hang on a second. I'm getting my notes. Um, I saw, the, I watched the uh, town council meeting now a week ago. And I know that you mentioned that there's asbestos and um, mold and what have you in the current uh, building. And so I just had a question about that, that we have staff working there. So I'm guessing that people wouldn't be working there if it was unsafe, but I'm just looking for a confirmation about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think we've got staff in unsafe situations. Generally, when you have asbestos in a building, it's it's concealed within the construction, or if it ends up being exposed, you do something like paint over it or seal it other ways, but it's still, you know, when you know you've got asbestos, it needs to be a priority to remediate that and get rid of it. Um, you know, the, the mold obviously is a situation we have recurring maintenance issues. So staff are safe, which is always our top priority, staff and public safety, um, but it's, it's not an adequate working environment long-term. The asbestos is in the glue holding the ceiling tiles to the ceiling. Oh, okay. So it's mo it's yeah. So you would you would work on the there. front office. They had to yeah. hermetically seal it off. Um, it's not friable, which is the term they often use. And um, just to speak on that further, and then I, I have to jump off in a couple minutes. But um, is we we seem to have these unexpected. Um, maintenance emergencies and it seems like every three or six months and this has been ongoing for several years so you know whether it's a, a sewer leak in the bathroom whether it's which then causes mold in the walls or um, some electrical issue and even our IT infrastructure has um, been struggling even over the last you know year and a half we've really experienced it through COVID and the expanded kind of all these zoom meetings and, and demand for bandwidth so um, we are constantly putting band-aids over them, um, but as, as everyone's mentioned, it's um, not a great sustainable long-term solution. Okay, and then the other thing that I had is that, and I, I may just be venting about this, but I just wanna say it. I received Mayor Beckman's August 30th briefing and I wrote a uh, message for inclusion in the council packet uh, in the briefing. Mayor Beckman chose to make a recommendation about how he thought that the people that were reading it, who were voters, how we, he thought we should vote. And it just seemed to me to be out of line that I've always considered that the town council members were nonpartisan and that that seemed to be an overreach and crossing a line into seriously partisan neighborhood. So I was disappointed to see that communication under that heading of um, a briefing from the mayor of our town. And so at the very least, I wanna get clarification. Am I confused 
Is it the intention for the council members to be nonpartisan or did I miss something or what's going on there? Uh, thanks, Karen. So, so the email that you're referring to is a campaign communication. It is not an, an official town communication. I don't want to get into the substance of it since this is a town event right now and we've got town staff on the line. Uh, you know, this is taxpayer funded. So I'm not going to talk about the content. Happy to discuss that with you offline. Um, but yes, council members are elected on a nonpartisan basis. Um, that doesn't mean that they don't have personal communications uh, that are not official town communications. And then I was curious what, you know, you said you submitted an email. So I was just curious where, what email address did you send that to? So we can just make sure uh, that we're not missing anything. I sent an email on the 3rd at 11 a.m. It said, is the town council's intent to be nonpartisan or not? Am I confused about this? And the first line said for inclusion in Corte Madera Town Council packet and basically covered a lot of what I just said. Um, and I get what you're saying, Eli. However, the very first thing that it says on the thing is from that your heading says from the mayor of Corte Madera. So while it doesn't come from your uh, mayoral, the town's email address, it certainly has the imprint of coming from the mayor of Corte Madera. Okay, thank you, Karen. I, I understand what you're saying. I'm happy to follow up with you offline. Again, don't want to, you know, use staff time on this. Um, but I did, you know, also of concern to me is that I did not see an email from you. So I need to go back and check my, my junk folder. And I know sometimes uh, emails from residents can get caught in my junk folder. So I'm going to go through and look through that and see if it's in there and then hopefully work with IT staff if it is to make sure. Yeah, well, I, I sent it to each member of the council plus Todd plus Rebecca. Okay, I certainly I, I can speak it. to that. I, I actually unfortunately missed the first line where it said for inclusion in the town council packet, but I forwarded it to our town attorney for review. Um, Good. We should make sure that it gets included in the packet. I can either add it to the public comment received for the last council meeting, or I can make sure it's in the council packet that's going to be published this week. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what, what, what's your preference on that? Do you want me to add it to the public comment received for the last meeting, or do you want it? Well, the, the election. Well, I, I, it just seemed to me like there was a line crossed. And so, yeah, I would like, I would like it. I know that somebody commented about it at the last uh, council meeting. They did. Uh, because I listened to the last council meeting. They were a little more feverish about it than I am. Um, I just want clarification and I don't want lines crossed. Okay. And um, Karen, in the future, when you send emails to the full council that uh, are intended for the council packet, um, it would probably make things clearer if you use the public comment at tcmmail.org address. That's where we okay. look for, for that. But it's fine to copy the council members too. Um, but yeah, I, I saw it and I forwarded it straight to the, the town attorney because I figured she would be asked about it. And then um, the council- So just say, say again the, the email address that it would probably been better for me to use. Um, well, just whenever you send everything to the full council uh, that you also want included in a council packet, uh, send it to public comment at tcmmail.org. Public comment at tcmmail. Okay, great. Yes. Okay, thank you. But but great. yes, it's fine to continue to send emails to the full council like that. Um, and um, sorry that I missed the very first line of that email. All right. Okay. Well, thank you, Karen. And I'll follow up with you offline if, if you want to discuss your concerns with me personally. Here, just don't do that anymore. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right, take care. We're gonna to go to Patty next. Welcome back everybody. Um, happy autumn. Uh, first, uh, I'm gonna be really jealous if anybody from the town council goes for a walk with Susie when I've wanted people from the town council to walk down Casa Buena since the mid eighties. So get in line, Susie. And um, uh, the, in terms of the overpass money, California's just uh, overflowing with surplus money. So this seems like the time to jump on that and say, hey, I've got a great idea of how to use some of that money. 
Uh, I thought, and Rebecca might remember this, I thought at the last meeting, Todd said that 100% of the employees of the town had been vaccinated. And um, I know that came up earlier about what the status of the town employees was. So I was thrilled and I, I brag about that. Um, and uh, Casa Buena, is the um, fence and the weeds along the east side, is that Caltrans or does the town take care of those weeds? Um, which one was, were on Casa Buena? Is it along the highway? Along the highway. Is that Caltrans? Oh, that is problem? Caltrans. Yes. They have a pretty okay. wide Caltrans right of way there, I know. Because I know you said that there was some clearing done on Casa Buena, and I wondered if it was on the west side or if it was on the freeway side. So the freeway side is all Caltrans. Um, there is one small section that is state property along the uphill side, but primarily um, the uphill side, it's technically the responsibility of each property owner. However, as part of our evacuation route improvements, um, the fire department has been coming through and um, trying to clear areas where we find that it's troublesome. Even on the freeway side? Not on the freeway side, no, because we don't have um, permission to go ahead and clear on that. Uh, all right, and are they dragging their feet on doing that or are they staying on it? Um, Caltrans, it's usually when we've reached out to them, it takes several weeks, if not months, because they've got the entire state that they need to clear. So um, it depends. They also have a priority and also they have their own work plan. And they what they end up doing is they start putting it into their file and then prioritizing areas based on need. Okay. Um, and then on the um, crossing that is in front of Pete's, Sometimes I'll come down Casa Buena and there's nobody anywhere near it, but the light is blinking. Is it subject to the wind or something? Is, is there something weird about that? That would probably be an RJ question. Um, that does sound a little odd though. Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could follow up with RJ. Yeah, um, which, are we talking that. about the traffic signals at Tama and Madera? No, 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 the pedestrian crosswalk where you push the button and it flashes. I wonder, I mean, I, I know sometimes sometimes you get, um, you know, the light still flashing after the pedestrians are already crossed right, and walked away, right. especially if they're speedy. But uh, yeah, that if, if there doesn't seem to be anybody there at all, then that is kind of a head scratcher. <laughs> it's the ghost of Corte Madera. Okay, <laughs> uh, well, thank you all for everything you're doing. Welcome back, Ashley. And I have to give you a call to bring back some papers for Age Friendly. Thank Great. you. Great, well, thank you so much, Patty. Great. Um, I'm not seeing any other hands up right now, so we'll just do another call. We've got like five minutes left if anybody has any last questions or comments. Otherwise, we can go ahead and let our staff get back to work. Um, not seeing any other hands up here. So thank you to everybody who joined us. Uh, it's good to see everybody and hear everybody again after, uh, after a long hiatus. And thank you so much to our staff members for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to come spend an hour with us. Really appreciate it. And I know uh, it was very helpful for all of us always is to hear the updates from you. So thank you so much. And uh, we've got a council meeting next Tuesday at 630. Um, and so that is, I, I think, the next public meeting that I am aware of. Um, and we hope to see folks there. All right, everybody, take care.